My name is John V. I'm your host for this episode of Chautauqua People. Our guest today is Paul Anthony, a broadcaster. Paul Anthony has spent over 45 years performing in all manner of broadcast and non-broadcast media. He's worked at every major network, including 20 years as weatherman on the NBC and CBS affiliates in Washington, D.C. Mr. Anthony has countless panel discussions and talk shows, the network radio for ABC and Mutual is frequently seen and heard nationally on PBS, including over 40 years as the announcer on the PBS program Washington Week, and has done extensive work as a commercial corporate spokesman for the Discovery and PBS. He's a Chautauquan of 33 years duration. Welcome to Chautauqua People. Paul. Thank you, John. Good to be here. Great. Good to be here. I understand you grew up in upstate New York. I did. I was in. Uh, I grew up in Rochester, New York, and uh, I left there at 18 to go to Georgetown University and never returned. I mean, except for family issues and things like that. Uh, but I did grow up in Western New York. Yes, indeed. Tell me about your first job out of college. Well, um, I have to go back a little bit to say that. Um, my father wanted me to have a trade when I got out of college, so liberal arts was not in the, in the lexicon of mm -hmm. things. So the closest thing to a trade was to be in the accounting school, where failing all else, you could become a bookkeeper, you know, that was mm -hmm. you could earn, earn a living. But about 90 seconds after I got in my first accounting course, <laughs> I said, you know what, I don't think I want to be a bookkeeper. Yeah. At that time, I was a big jazz fan, even at 18 years of age, mm -hmm. having started about five years earlier, uh, you know, liking it. And they had an FM radio station on the campus at Georgetown, which I auditioned for. I got, you know, a three or four hour show a week. And at the end of the year, we had a big banquet, and uh, they gave me the award for the best program on the entire station. And I Wonderful. said, whoa. Because I never, it wasn't like I wanted to be in broadcasting from the time I was three, you know, anything like that. I just wanted to play the music that I liked. Mm -hmm. And I said, gee, you know, if I'm getting awards playing with half a deck here, maybe if I apply myself, that's what I can do. So uh, I stayed with the accounting course, mm -hmm. graduated with that, which is a CPA prep kind of course, and then uh, was not going to do that. So I got a job at a club. They fired me near the end of the summer because of financial issues. And I went to Georgetown to look in the career place, ran across Father Dan Power, a Jesuit, who right. uh, took me in his office immediately, set up an appointment with the new fledgling public television station, and I went and see them the next Monday, and I got a job there. And how long have you been employed with that station? I was officially employed with them for two years full time. Correct. And then uh, I went to NBC, very young, uh, and but I maintained my relationship with them from that time, '64, through um, the present time. As a freelancer, I'd come back and do things for them. Right, right. Have you done some graduate work? Yes. Uh, when I joined WETA, their studios were located at Howard University in Washington. And we were right near the reservoir. If anybody's ever been there, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So we had waterfront property when we had this, <laughs> <laughs> when we were going to school there. And it happened to be a mile away from Catholic University of America. Right. Which had a very good drama program, speech and drama program. Right. I was working nights, so I enrolled in day school in the graduate program. Uh, figured, you know, why waste my days? I was single, I had nothing, you know, no domestic entanglements. So I went there and two years uh, in a master's program there. Right. Yeah. Now tell me how you came to Chautauqua. Well, I have to again say that growing up in Rochester as a Roman Catholic in the times that I did, uh, and the fact that uh, Chautauqua was a purely, at that time, Protestant community with a little bit of Catholic presence, I mean, but very, it was a Protestant community. Um, I never knew about Chautauqua. Mm -hmm. because it was kind of off the religious map as we knew it at that time. Right. So I didn't know anything about it. I was doing a film shoot in Jamestown for some government agency. Mm -hmm. And we had a half a day off, and one of the local guys said, you want to take a ride? I said, sure. So I said, where are we going? And he says, we're going to the Chautauqua Institute, which clearly is a local fellow because it's institution, of course. Mm -hmm. So, but he took me there. It was I can tell you the date. It was June 19, 
1980. Mm -hmm. Okay, we go through the front gate because it wasn't you need a pass to get in. He took me just around the perimeter, probably be a 10 minute ride through the front of the Athenaeum along the lake and this and that and the other thing. And I fell in love. I was totally captivated by the concept and what I saw in terms of the buildings and the way things went, knowing nothing about it other than just that. Right. Uh, my wife Joanne and I came down on a spur of the moment one week after season began. She happily <laughs> liked it as much as I did. Right. And um, we bought our first house in October, again, having spent one full week here only. Mm -hmm. But we made a commitment to it, and we've been here ever since. No regrets. No regrets. Now, tell me what you perceive as the level of Catholic involvement in Chautauqua at the time of your purchase. At the time of the purchase, uh, we were, um, there was very little Catholic involvement. We had Father Al. Alfonso Kunz, who was in Mayville here at St. Mary's, who was the pastor there, and because he was technically Chautauqua was in his parish, right? He would do one mass on Sunday at 9:15, and that was it. So, through a bunch of shenanigans, I went to him and I went to the Buffalo Diocese, and I said, you know, if we could bring priests in here that you wouldn't have to pay for. Would you allow us to do that so we could increase the Catholic presence on the grounds? Well, after a lot of machinations and soul searching and all kinds of stuff on their part, by the way, um, we managed to get that done in 1980, probably 82, 83. Right. Um, and then 80, formally, the, the Chautauqua Catholic community was formed around 1985. We had a Mrs. Betty Linnae, who many local people will know well right. for her philanthropy, who was also Roman Catholic, was kind enough to buy us a house right on the brick walk behind the amphitheater. And you stepped into the inner circle. And we stepped into the coveted brick walk, you know, between the uh, Methodists and, and the, the Presbyterians. The Presbyterians, that's right. And uh, I have to say that Dan Bratton, who was the president at the time, when A, the Catholic community was formally started. Right. B, when we got the house, was most supportive of our presence there. And although, you know, it's, the place is steeped in 120 years of, of, of Protestantism, he was thrilled that we were there and in, in a spirit of ecumenism was very, very nice to us. So. And, and strong affirmation then from the administration for that presence. Absolutely. For that presence. Well, I have to make one other story here. Sir. At one point, Cardinal, um, Cardinal from Washington, whose name McCarrick? is McCarrick. McCarrick, very good, thank you. As a good Presbyterian, you did pretty <laughs> You're doing very well. Um, Cardinal McCarrick had been booked in by Joan Brown Campbell to do the 1045 on Sunday, you know, the ecumenical right. series. And he then became Cardinal, which is a big deal, of course, but he was already booked in, so he came to visit us. And we had a mass, and this is the kicker, we had a mass in the Methodist House Chapel. That's the Chautauqua way. Okay. And I introduced him, because I was president of the community at the time, and I said, you know, I said, as short to go as 20 years, this could never have happened. Mm -hmm. He got up and gave a very eloquent introduction to the mass, saying precisely the same thing. You know, he says, we're here, in, under, you know, it was very poetically done, beautifully done. But that's, we have, our, we have our lectures every week at the Methodist House Chapel to this day. And you hold Mass where? In the Episcopalian Chapel. Now, when the Episcopalians <clears throat> were doing a major remodeling of right. their house, did the Catholic community help them? We certainly did, and I think justifiably, because we, you know, they were using it one day a week. Mm -hmm. for a little service on Thursday mornings, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, we were using it twice a day, every day, you know, Monday through Friday. Right. <clears throat> and the rector at the time, whose name I can't remember, Paul, it was Paul or something, um, he came to us and he said, you know, he said, God must be on our side. And I said, why? He said, because since you people have been using this chapel, we're getting more and more response from our own Episcopalian community that we should maybe do more. And it's, he was making it sound as if it was divine intercession, mm -hmm. you know? And my wife said to him, um, Reverend, she said, I think it's called publicity. 
now that they know that there's an Episcopalian that's chapel, right. since our name is in it every day. So that's what happens. So they use it now every day. That's right. You know? One last point about that yes. chapel. It's the only Episcopalian facility I know that has a stained glass window of a Roman Catholic well, Pope. Well, Pope John. Pope John XXIII. Pope John XXIII. And he's, right. he clearly exemplified yeah. the spirit yes, of the times. absolutely. Right. And we've had a wonderful relationship with them and throughout the, the last 20 years. So. Right. Now tell me about your children at Chautauqua. We had three children. We had an older daughter who was kind of old, too old when we got in there to be part of that, uh, the mix of kids that go there. But my two sons were much younger and really got into it. They were in the children's school and they were in the boys and girls club. They became counselors, you know, when they finally got old enough to do it. And this has been probably the greatest thing we ever did for them, was to bring them here. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have flourished through it. My middle child, first son, uh, two years ago, built a house right down along Bester Plaza on a vacant lot and made a serious commitment at age 42 to be here with his two boys, okay? Right. Which I think is the ultimate thing. My other son, who lives in Denver, Colorado and has four boys, comes here for four or five weeks every summer as well. So right. they're just committed, and, the, and the, the, the relationships they forged in those things continue to flourish today. And while they're in disparate parts of the country and not joined at the hip, when it comes time, if thing, the chips are down, boy, they, they congeal. The, they are tight, aren't they? They're very tight, and absolutely. That, that's just a wonderful legacy from mm -hmm. the <coughs> Chautauqua absolutely. upbringing. Absolutely. And I assume that most all, they all of them internalize the values of Chautauqua. Yes, indeed. Among those friends and doing indeed. with their business. Now, tell me, tell me about um, your wife. What has been her involvement in Chautauqua? Well, uh, you know, she's the general. You know, Correct. <laughs> and somebody said to me the other day, I said, why are, you, why are you here? He said, my program director told me I needed to be here. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, she has been the anchor, the glue, everything about it. When the, we started the Catholic community back in, you know, 82 or 83, it was her and me and a couple of other people. Right. She had to take care of all the masses, she had to set up the altars, she had to do all that stuff for, you know, three or four or five years uh, right. in that regard, as well as take care of a house and all the other things that go with it. Right. So she's been a very good partner in this whole lot. And been, been an advocate of it. And, and she grew, she's, was born somewhere close to here. She was she born in Buffalo, technically, right. Right. but at six weeks of age, her father got a job in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. He was working on the USS Missouri. Okay. And they moved to New York. So she spent her whole life growing up in New York. Right. Now tell me what changes you've seen in your many years here at Chautauqua. Well, you know, anybody who's been here any length of time, and you and your family have been here far longer than we have been. Uh, I mean, you grew up here as a young boy, and your, you know, your parents mm -hmm. had a house here. My first visit was in utero. It's right. So, and do you remember anything from that? Not, but, but I do have pictures of very much of a newborn on my father's lap sitting on a porch. Well, so, you, I mean, that's, that's really, the that's the kind of the Chautauqua way, you know, that that's kind right. of thing. But um, anybody who grew up in those times uh, kind of got used to the fabric of the community, which was uh, populated in most cases, many cases, by teachers mm -hmm. who had the summers off. And they'd live rather humbly in some of those dwellings that we had at, at the Chautauqua at the time. Um, but they spent the whole summer. They were seasoned people. Right. And, and over the years, because of inflated costs, because of people like me, maybe, who came in and took a house and did something new to it, mm -hmm. um, this kind of proliferated, which kind of prevented and removed those seasoned people from the mix. Right. And now, because again, because of the cost and just the, the way we now operate in America, where you know you're in five soccer camps, you got this, and I mean it's like a nut house for most most young parents. Um, you reduced this coming here for one or two weeks, right? And by virtue of that, kind of the inherent spirit that you grew up with at Chautauqua is just not there. There's no institutional memory. Mm -hmm. So, for example, to give you a mundane example, we have the brick walk on which we do not allow any kind of vehicular traffic, which includes bicycles, uh, which is the only way you can get through there. Well, now we frequently see young kids and even their parents riding bikes in there, weaving in and out of, you know, frequently old people on their walkers, you know, whatever they're right. doing. 
And I feel like an old curmudgeon old man. You know, I'll say, stop. I say, come here. This is with the kids. The parents, I can't repeat on television what mm -hmm. they tell me, okay, if I say mm -hmm. that. Um, I say, you know, you're not supposed to be on this brick walk like this. Most of the kids will say, okay, sir, you know, when they trot off and do their thing. Right. Sometimes the parents are, you know, keep your mouth shut. Uh, we're not interested in your input in this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the kind of thing, in my experience, would not have happened as readily right. in the past. Right. So that, you know, it's just, and again, I'm not a reactionary. I don't feel like we need to go back to the beginning right. and do it just like we did it in 1893 or something. Yeah. The change is absolutely necessary. It's just that when you remember that stuff, right. the changes, particularly as dramatic as they become right. now, really affect you and, and you know, mean more, more meaningful to you. Right. Now, how has the programming changed over your duration of experience with Chautauqua? Well, the, again, because money was always an issue with the mm -hmm. institution in terms of who they could get, mm -hmm. and because their profile was not as high as it is now, uh, you got a lot of a academicians who would come here, professors who were experts in history or whatever the topics were, um, governmental people mm -hmm. because they couldn't ask for fees that were outrageous and things right. of that nature. Right. And, and the, the, the bar has continued to rise right. where you, know, you can't get some people um, unless you work a special deal with them Right. You know, for twenty-five or thirty thousand, you know, right. or fifty thousand, right. to come for a forty-five-minute lecture. You know, right. I mean, this is outrageous. I mean, for th for their budgetary concerns. Mm -hmm. um, if I have anything to say about the, the programming now, um, is that over the last, particularly the last five to ten years, we've seen a, a lot of repeat people there. Right. Part of it is that these people become enamored with. The institution. They do. And when they come back the second time, they say, you know, I charged you 10000 last time. Let me bring my family. We'll spend a week here. Right. And I'll charge you five. Right. Okay? So everybody's happy. Right. But the consequence of that is, is that if you're here all the time, like we are for the season, you know, I've seen these, some of these people three or four times in five years. Right. You know? Right. And while they change slightly their act, so to speak, right. you know, I'm pretty familiar with it. Right. Uh, the orchestra continues to be great. The kids, the MFSO, MSFO, just astoundingly talented. Right. And the ballet school, we used to, in the beginning, before Jean-Pierre Bonfou got here, we used to refer to, they do Swan Lake or something mm -hmm. on the stage. And we used to call it the dance of the sugar plum elephants. Oh, the goodness. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it was just, you know, it just wasn't up to par. But when you get somebody like him and his wife, um, who were prima ballerina in her day. Right. Things have, so things have gotten better. The theater company is outstanding. Absolutely. Absolutely dead, full stop outstanding. Right. Uh, opera continues to struggle. They do some very good productions, but it, it's so, um, how can I say, it, it's, it, you have to be so elaborate to get into opera. Right. But they're now doing it on the stage, which requires less of that, which is good. If you're an opera right. puff, right. the arias are the same. You have the orchestra there. Right. So. I think one of the observations made about the current opera format doing it on the stage is that it introduces new people to opera. Right. And, the, and that is that in terms of the educational goal of Chautauqua. Mm -hmm. That's a very important item. Yep. And um, we know it's still a very expensive art form. Yes. And, uh, regrettably, some would say this is a disappearing art form. But we've made a decision to preserve it and, and to do it in a way that, that should, should introduce new people to opera. Right. Well, you, Arthur Gelb, I think his name is Arthur Gelb, but Gelb, who was the head of the Met in New York, mm -hmm. spoke here a few years ago. And he said, when I first took over the Met, he said, I peeked out from behind the curtain and looked out into the audience for a particular performance. And he said, I thought to myself, in 10 years, three quarters of these people will be dead because they were so old, you know, the, the old right. demographic. Right. He said, what can I do to fill these seats when these people no longer can be here. Right. So we started putting the Met on the Jumbotron at Times Square. Mm -hmm. He goes into theaters all over the country, uh, showing La Traviata or whatever it happens to be, in order to do what you said, is to open it to a wider group. Right. And some who's a, like a, a, you know, a slob like me, doesn't mind watching a four-hour opera if I can have popcorn and maybe go out for a hot dog, you know, at the, at the right. end break. Right. Where at the Met, of course, you could never do that. Right. Yeah. I have friends from Chautauqua here who go, I think it's in Erie, 
and see a big screen production yeah. of opera. And if you talk in the slightest about they're changing their plans, they get furious. Oh, yeah. This, yeah. Is, this is no other. Yeah. Let me ask you about one other question, mm -hmm. a change along the way. You said your children all were sent to, the two youngest ones were sent to club. Right. And now the current generation is going. How was the, the experience different of the younger generation than it was of those who are now middle-aged? Yeah, in their own family? I, well, I have grandchildren now. I have six boy Goodness. grandchildren Goodness. who are populated all over the place. And they're both in the children's school and the club, the right. boys, boys and girls club. And in the children's school, for example, my uh, namesake, Paul, um, in his class, a group of people that may be 30, 35 kids, there are only four in that group that are seasoned people, that are here for really? the entire time. Four of 30. So. Four of 30, give, you know, give or take. Yeah. When my sons were in that group, out of 30, let's pick 30 again, mm -hmm. probably 22 of them were seasoned. Really? So when you were with those kids, right. year after year, right. this is where the relationships are forged. Right. I can almost predict that my grandsons will have, you know, friends here and there, but not this kind of Gang, right? So group many of, of them friends, yeah, ready yeah. to pour in when there's a crisis. Exactly, exactly. Crisis. Now, Paul, you have had a wonderful involvement in Chautauqua, and you've made some enormous improvements and changes in the way th things are done. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations for issues that probably ought to be addressed, <coughs> and and ideas for improvement? Well, you know, this is a very subjective topic, and yes, you may have a totally different group of things, and. Uh, uh, let me, by way of illustration, t tell you the story. Michael Eisner, who was the head of Disney right. at the time, came to Chautauqua for the first time because his wife was from Jamestown. Mm -hmm. okay? And she said, you have to see this place. Well, he fell in love with the concept. And he literally duplicated the institution at a big place down in, in Florida, Disney World. Mm -hmm hoping to do the same kind of thing where people would take courses, they do whatever they wanted to do. And it was a total disaster. I mean, just failed. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we've talked about it. why do you think it happened? In my opinion, it failed because that operation didn't have the subtle underpinning of religion to the whole mix. It's one of our Chautauqua pillars. Yes, it's a cradle, you know? Right. And there are people, atheists, you know, people who are not religious come. Of course, you have other things to do. It's not thrown down your throat. You do what you want to do, you come and go. But the f what a religious community brings to the civility table, uh, I don't think can be duplicated. And right. he had none of that, of course, because right. that wasn't his thing. Right. But uh, I don't think you can... Un so, having said that, there have been some changes in the way the religious department works out. And again, I understand economics and all the other stuff, um, which has kind of taken away from the, um, the, what we normally did for the religion and ethics right. lecture in the afternoon. Right. Frequently there was a, a professor or a cleric or you know, some preacher who would come in and he'd be there Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. And each day he would develop a certain topic mm -hmm. and by the end of the week you got a pretty good idea of what he was all about. And I frankly enjoy those things for the most yeah. part. Now it's disparate. It's all over the place and I don't mm -hmm. know. So continuing to develop a longer, more intense theme, probably with some good readings that would go along with it. Yeah, I mean, just it, it, right now, we're, we've even changed the name. It's no longer the religion lecture. It's the interfaith lecture, right. okay? which allows it to have, to, to, it's kind of an open book. When you say that, you say, oh, we can do anything almost in there. Okay? Got it. And there's one other thing that the institution has done. And again, in principle and in theory, in a perfect world, it is a great idea. Right. And that is they take the theme of the week, which is on the main platform at 1045. Right. And in order, and this I think is, is a byproduct of the one week people mm -hmm. who come for one week only. Mm -hmm. And the institution wants them to immerse themselves as fully as possible in the Chautauqua experience. Right. Okay. So they keep this common thread. If you're talking about the ultimate, the elegant universe was the first right. one of the night 2013 right. season. Uh, a very interesting and wonderful program in the main platform. 
but they then require you to do it in the afternoon, the religion and ethics part, mm -hmm. to also address this from about the elegant universe. Well, right. sometimes the topics work, you know, to, to integrate right. each other. Sometimes, you know, they seem it's a stretch. They're it's just, a stretch. You know, you get to that. So it's that kind of thing. And it, these are little nuances. And I know that they are driven mainly by financial exigencies, which, right. you know, Right. We're not privy to or know mm -hmm. what they have to do. So. so how many more years will you come to Chautauqua? You know, as long as I'm standing erect and taking solid food. Uh, <laughs> You'll be <laughs> here. Or even in Chautauqua, you don't need to stand erect. You could, you could go around your cart. That's right. And we'll be on each other's porch solving the world's problems. <laughs> That's exactly right. So This has been terrific. Thank you very much. This has been Chautauqua People. My name is John V. My guest has been Paul Anthony, long-term Chautauquan broadcaster, and one heck of a good guy. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you, John. It's been a pleasure. Bye.